These five dye samples have been loaded into a gel and are under an electric current. What do you notice about how they move? This process is called gel electrophoresis. Find out how to do it yourself. Hi, my name is Julie Yu, and I'm a scientist in the Exploratorium Teacher Institute. In this activity, we're going to build and run a gel electrophoresis device. All that means is we're going to use electricity to separate molecules. Now, you can buy gel electrophoresis chambers, but they usually cost a few hundred dollars. We're going to make one for under five bucks. The way we're going to do that is to use discarded materials. And the first thing is uh, the chamber, the thing that's going to hold all of your samples. And I'm using a plastic box. You can use any size, but a rectangular plastic box, um, one that doesn't leak water is what you need. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to pour a gel eventually, and that's going to turn into a semi-solid matrix that the samples run through. But in order to load the samples, you need to make little divots, little wells in the gel. And the way we do that is to create a comb. We're going to make a comb using craft sticks. I have two kind of popsicle-sized craft sticks, and then a couple of these thinner, narrower um, coffee stirrer kind. And basically, you want your comb to have teeth that the coffee stirrers are going to be to that, that sit down inside your gel. We're going to pour a liquid gel, and it's going to set. And then when we remove the comb, it's going to leave empty spaces that are going to serve as our wells. I'm just going to cut the coffee stirrers with some scissors. And the larger popsicle sticks are going to serve as the bread in a sandwich that wedges the teeth of the comb in between. I'm going to measure out how deep, how long that coffee stirrer needs to be by looking at my box. And I only want a small gap in between the bottom of the tooth and the bottom of my box. I don't want it to touch the box because that would poke a hole all the way down in my gel. I need a small gap so that there's a little bit of gel just below the well. Once I have that sized correctly, I'm just going to use masking tape. And the way I recommend doing it, got to size it again, is to tape the comb directly to one of the popsicle sticks. And then keep adding teeth until you have the number of teeth you want. I'm going to make a five tooth comb. So let me cut another one. Now that I have this one sized, I'm just going to use the first one to figure out how to position that second tooth. And you just keep taping on teeth until you've created a comb. When you have the number of teeth you want, you can take that second popsicle stick to make sure to secure those teeth in place. And just tape the whole thing together. So I have one here that I've made before where you can see I have five teeth that are wedged in between two popsicle sticks. This is going to sit nicely inside my box. There's a small gap between the bottom of the teeth and the bottom of the box. And now I'm ready to get my gel together. The next thing you want to do is to prepare the solutions for the things that are going to go inside your chamber, the gel and electrolyte solution. You need an electrolyte solution because you're conducting electricity through liquid. And so that liquid needs to have some salt. The electrolyte I'm going to use is baking soda, or sodium bicarbonate. And I made a solution that's 0.2% sodium bicarbonate, which means 2 grams in 1 liter of water. That electrolyte solution is both going to be what we call the buffer, the liquid that goes in the gel, and it's also going to be the liquid that we make the gel out of. Now, the jelly part comes from agar-agar. In laboratories, you might use lab-grade agarose, but that's just a purified form of agar-agar, which is something you can get from seaweed. You can buy agar-agar um, often in Asian grocery stores or health food stores because it's a vegetarian gel because it's made from seaweed. The way you make your gel solution 
is to take um, about 1% agar agar uh, in a solution of electrolyte buffer. So I took two grams of agar agar and added 200 milliliters of buffer solution. And the special thing and the reason we use agar agar is that it is liquid um, at temperatures above 50 or 60 degrees centigrade and solid at room temperature. So you can melt it either over a stove or I actually put both into this flask and stuck it in a microwave. And then slowly heat it and swirl it to dissolve the agar agar. And as it reaches that melting temperature of agar agar, it's gonna dissolve into solution. And right now this is a little warm, so it's still liquid. But you wanna pour your gel while it's a liquid and then as it cools to room temperature, it's gonna become our solid gel. So now that you have your comb in your box in your gel solution, we're gonna pour the gel so that it gets ready for us to load our samples. Once you have your comb assembled and your gel solution made, you should pour your gel so it has time to solidify before you're ready to run your samples. If you made your gel, gel solution ahead of time and it's solidified, that's totally fine. Just pop it in the microwave until it melts again. You wanna put your comb into your box so that it's just a few centimeters from one of the ends. It doesn't matter which end. And then when you pour your gel, you only want to pour enough to submerge just a few millimeters of the comb. We're only making very small wells. If you pour a huge thick gel, it'll work. It'll just take longer to run. I'm impatient, so I'm going to pour a thin gel. Once your gel is poured, set your box in a place where it can sit undisturbed until it solidifies and it'll solidify when it cools down to room temperature. While your gel is solidifying, you can make a power supply that's gonna provide the electric current that's gonna move your samples through the gel. You need a source of power and electrodes. And to, for electrodes, I like to use stainless steel wire because it's non-reactive. You can just take stainless steel wire, you can usually cut it with scissors or wire cutters if you have them, but you want a piece that's gonna span the width of your box. So I have a spare box here, and I have a couple of stainless steel electrode pieces that I've cut. And you can see that the length of the electrode spans the width of my box. And then I cut a little more so that I could hook on to the side of it, and that way it'll stay in place. And you could tape it in place if you're worried about it moving around. You need two because there's going to be a positive terminal and a negative terminal. So I have my two stainless steel electrodes in place. And now I need to figure out a way to apply power. My power source is going to be batteries. Uh, a lot of times gel electrophoresis chambers run at 120 volts. This is going to be a 45 volt power supply. And the way we're going to do that is just by stitching together five 9 volt batteries. You'll notice on a 9 volt battery that, that the two terminals look a little different. There's one that's a little cylinder end and one that's, that, that has a grabby end. That grabby end actually fits perfectly to grab onto the cylinder end. So I can just stitch these nine volts together. And every time I add one on, I'm adding nine more volts to the power supply. And by the time I'm done, I have a 45 volt supply that has a negative terminal and a positive terminal. I have some alligator clip leads here. And I can use those to attach my power supply this together. To my box. So this was my sample box, but once my gel is solid, I'm going to insert the electrodes and then I'll be ready to apply electricity across it. Once your gel is set, you're ready to put everything together and run your samples. I like to check if my gel is set just by gently touching the bottom corner and I can feel that it is now solid. I need to make some room to place those electrodes that I made earlier. So I'm just gonna cut and you can use scissors or I have a, a mat knife here. that I'm just gonna cut out a chunk of gel, which you can see now is solid. And that's where I'm gonna place my electrode. So I need one at the bottom
and one at the top. You can see I did a poor job cutting, but it's just fine. You just need to make room. You can feel free to recycle these gel bits um, and remelt them for your next test case. Once you have your electrodes in place, remember we need to cover this whole thing with buffer because we want the electricity to be applied across the whole span of the chamber. So that buffer that I made, that sodium bicarbonate buffer, I'm gonna pour it, and again, I just wanna cover just the top of the gel. I don't wanna fill the whole chamber with buffer because electricity is gonna prefer the lower resistance of the buffer than the gel, and I want it to run through the gel because it's gonna pull my samples out. So I'm going to pour just enough buffer such that it covers the entire gel and also the gaps I made by cutting away the gel bits. Now you're ready to gently remove your comb because you want to use the wells, the little indentation that it leaves behind to load your samples. And I'm going to do that by pinching both ends of the comb and pulling straight up. And you can see that I have five wells that are caused by the five teeth that were in my comb. I can also see that I didn't add quite enough buffer because one of the wells is sticking up, so add a little bit more. Now everything's covered. So I have my gel ready to be loaded, my power supply ready to be attached. Now I need to run some samples. The samples we're gonna run today are food coloring dyes. And I made five different samples using five different dyes. And the way you make your samples, I took just a drop, I didn't really measure, a drop of food coloring, a drop of glycerin, which you can get in a pharmacy, and I mixed it in about one milliliter of water. The glycerin is to make the sample a little more dense than the buffer, so that when I load it, it sinks right into the well. And I have, uh, I've transferred those samples into these little tubes I only need to load a very small amount, around 10 microliters. That's an incredibly small volume. So I'm gonna use this needle tip disposable pipette. In a molecular biology lab, you might use a fancy micro pipetter, but in order to keep this classroom budget friendly, I'm gonna use this plastic pipette and the volume that fits in this thin needle tip is around 10 microliters. So I'm gonna to try to withdraw some, just enough sample that it fits this needle tip and no more. And then I'll know I'll have about the right amount. The other thing you wanna be conscious of when you're loading your samples is that you don't jab a hole into the gel with the tip of the pipette. So you just, once you have your sample loaded, you're gonna hover just above the well and then squeeze it in. And again, because it's denser than the buffer, it's just gonna fall nicely into the gel. I like to load my gel with a dark background because it's much easier to see the wells. This takes a little practice, but you can practice trying to load your pipette as much as you want. And then when you're confident, you can go ahead and load your gel. So here I go, I'm gonna load my first sample. Maybe you can see that I have just enough sample to fill that needle tip. And then I'm gonna hover right over my well, not jabbing it in, and squeeze it in. You could see some of it went into the buffer, but most of it fall, fell nicely into that rectangular gel. And I've rinsed the pipette, so I'm okay using it for the next sample. Once you have all your samples loaded, you're ready to connect your power supply and run the gel. Remember, the power supply has a negative terminal and a positive terminal, and it's important that you connect it in the right orientation. The dye molecules have a negative charge, so they will move away from the negative electrode towards the positive one. So you want to connect the negative terminal to the end where your samples are, and the positive terminal to the end where you want your samples to move. And you actually can tell it's working by looking for bubbles along the length of the electrode. 
That's actually electrolysis happening within the, the buffer. So I see bubbles, I know my power supply is working, and I'm ready to check out how my samples will run. Now this will take about 15 to 20 minutes. You can see some movement right away, but to really see separation, you want to wait some time. And it's actually easiest to see the separation on a white background. So I'm going to pull in a white sheet of paper and just slide that underneath. And you can see now that I can watch my samples as they run down towards the positive terminal. So what happened? My gel ran for around 20 minutes, and I, took, I disconnected the power supply, took it out, blotted it dry with a paper towel, and here it is. You can see that the five dye samples have moved down. They, remember we had the negative electrode attached here, and they moved towards the positive. And this is where my, my fingers are where the wells initially were. So all of the samples moved, but they moved different distances. And the reason they move different distances is because they all move at different rates, depending on the size of the molecules. You can see that in this first lane, the blue dye moved the least. That means it took the slowest amount of time. In that second lane, we had a red dye. In that third lane, we had a yellow dye, which turns out to have a little bit of red in it. So this brand of yellow food coloring has a little bit of red. And the yellow moved the furthest of all which means it moves the fastest. The rate that the dyes move actually depends on their size. <clears throat> the smaller the molecules are, the quicker they move through the gel. The larger ones, like the blue ones, kind of lumber through and take longer to pass towards um, the electrode that they're moving towards. The other thing you might notice is these fourth and fifth lanes have multiple colors. This fourth lane was the green dye, so it has a little bit of blue and yellow mixed in. There's actually no green dye molecule in this brand of green food coloring. In the purple, you can see that separated out into blue and red. But the thing to notice is that the blue dye molecules are all the same. So the blue dye molecules that's in green and purple is the same as the blue dye molecule in blue food coloring. And we know this because they all migrated at the same rate. Same thing with the reds and then the yellows, fastest of all. The idea of separating molecules based on their charge and size um, in a gel electrophoresis chamber is actually the method that's behind the technique of DNA fingerprinting. So in a lot of biotechnology labs, DNA is manipulated in these ways, and they also are negatively charged, just like the colored dye molecules, and they'll migrate towards a positive terminal. And the rate at which they migrate depends on their size. So if you have a well filled with different size fragments of DNA, you can slowly separate them out where the smallest ones will move further down and the larger ones will take their time. That creates a banded pattern. You can do, two you can do one of two things. You can either you know, pick the size of DNA you want and manipulate it in a laboratory, or you can actually see that the banded pattern is a unique pattern that um, has been cut out of a longer strand of DNA. And that's the idea behind DNA fingerprinting, is that when you cut our DNA with certain enzymes, we each have a different pattern that's based on our specific unique DNA sequence. Um, so another thing that's nice about this gel is because there's not DNA in a DNA dye in there, it's um, non-toxic and friendly, so you can dispose this right into your trash, or you can wrap it up in plastic wrap and save it. Thank you.